the Apostle Paul has been showing us how to leave the past behind and how to move forward with a fresh start in hope. And that's what we've been looking at in Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, we have the Apostle Paul telling us about these new clothes that we need to be putting on, putting off the old clothes of the former way of life, having a renewing of the mind, and putting on these new clothes that are, have been given to us and made for us in the image of God and true righteousness and holiness. And as we've been going through this, we've noted that it's not just simply stop these sins, but observing that there is truly a, a shift of life, that leave the past behind, have a change of mind, and here are the new things to do instead of that old life. And along the way, each time, the Apostle Paul is telling us the reason why. And so last week I asked if we were wearing angry clothes. And today I'm going to ask if we're wearing corrupt clothes, because that is the picture that's given to us in Ephesians 4, verses 28 through 30. You'll notice the first set of clothing picture that he gives to us it, it is there in verse 28. The wording is interesting because the phrase as the ESV has it, let the thief no longer steal, it, it's hard to say the words there because in that phrase, there are no nouns. And in English, you have to have a noun to do anything. You can't have, you know, this is grade school 101, we need a noun and a verb if we're going to have a sentence. And so here it's interesting because the wording is essentially stealing, no longer stealing. That's what it's told to you. And I think that's important because I think if we think about a thief, we go, oh, well, I'm not a thief. You know, I know who thieves are, and I'm not a thief. But he's not talking about the profession of thievery. And he's not talking about that at all. But if you take, stop taking. If you steal, stop stealing. And that's a, a, as short, as compact as he could possibly give it. And I think it is important to consider really how succinct that is. Stealing, stop stealing. Because I want you to notice there's no excuses given here for it. Sometimes we have a tendency to go, well, it's okay for me to take because, well, they took for me. Or I'm not getting my fair share. Or I don't have, so I should be able to take. And I want you to see there's no built-in excuses, there's no loopholes, there's no options, there's no, well, don't steal, but under these circumstances, you go right ahead. If, if these conditions apply that, you know, you're in need or you don't have or, you know, you're being mistreated, then you just go right ahead and do that. And I want us just to see that it's just straightforward. God says that the people of God are not to be people who take. And I think that should make sense because ultimately stealing, taking, that's just selfishness. You'll notice as you go through these old clothes that each aspect of them derives from selfishness. Why am I going to take from somebody else? Because I'm thinking about myself. That's another reason to do it. I'm going to steal because, well, I'll actually get down to it, I'm thinking about myself. And so, so often what is pictured for us is that the issue about old clothing, that this former life that we are to put off, is the problem of selfish thinking. This is really what the renewal of the mind is all about, is that we would stop thinking about ourselves. Because if we are taking and stealing, and that this is the aspect then of thinking about self, thinking about what I want or what I need or what I deserve to have. And the Apostle Paul just puts an end to that. And notice what the new clothes are when you look at verse 28 when he says, so here's what you're supposed to do. If we're not to be takers, then what we are to do is to take care of ourselves by working with our own hands, he says. Here's how you solve the solution of need and wants and desires is that you work with your own hands. My dad loved this one too. You will not work either way you eat. He loved that one too, me all the time. And this one, you want something, go get a job. That's what he told me. And that's the idea that's given a picture here, is that we don't take from other people. That's not what Christians do. 
but rather he says that we would work with our own hands. That the Christian does not have the expectation of stealing from others, taking from others, or expecting that kind of thing from others. But rather notice the reversal of thought that's given in verse 28. Why is this so important? I don't want you to steal. Stop being a taker. Do honest work. Take care of your own finances. But why? Look at verse 28. So that you would be able to have something to give. You notice how he switches the selfishness to sacrificial? Stop thinking about yourself and what you want and your things. No, you do work. Why? So that you can be a benefit to other people. So that you're not looking at yourself, but you're looking at the needs of others. And I think this is important and why we would have this picture given to us is because as Christians, we ultimately remember, acknowledge, recognize, and give thanks to God that everything we have is from God. We don't despise work because God gave us that. We don't despise our job because God gave us that. We don't despise the wealth that we have because God gave us that. We are content with what we have because we understand God has given it to us, but also that he didn't give it to us so that we would just stack it to the ceiling, but that we would be able to see if somebody was in need, that we could do something about it. That God gives to us so that we can do something with it. It, 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 it. It's a great passage in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 8 through 11, where the Apostle Paul talks ex extensively about that, uh, that you are being given these things and, and have this generosity to others so that God will continue to give you what you have so that you can continue to give to others. This is the picture that's given to us is that the Christians are not takers and stealers and trying to swindle and I'm going to get my fair share or get my cut out of somebody, but we are givers. We want to give. And with what God has blessed us with, we want to share that with other people. And so the beautiful picture that he just starts off with, it's old clothes. It's the former way of life. If you walk into finances and walk into your situation and say, now what can I get out of somebody else? What can I take from them? What do I think they don't need so I can have it? That's the old clothes. That's the former way of life. That's worldliness. The Christian way of thinking is God will take care of me and what he gives me I'm going to use to help other people. I'm going to be a blessing to them. I'm not going to worry about me. I'm going to be a blessing to them. If you remember at the end of uh, 2020, we were helping out Marcia go back to the Caribbean to be with her mom. It had a neat little interaction that happened in the foyer that I think illustrates this so well. I don't, I don't know if it, there was nobody around this, but she had come in and she said that she had found like $10 on the ground, just, you know. And here we were as individuals all trying to help her so that she could go back and, and, and begin to take care of her mother. And so I said to her, you should keep that because there's, it's not obvious whose it is, and God's giving you a blessing that you would take that because you need the help to go. And she said, oh, no. And she put it in that black box back there and said, God will take care of me, and I'm not going to dare take this. <laughs> I just loved that on the inside. I just was so warmed by that. But that's that mentality. It's the mentality of, oh, God's going to take care of me. I've got this. So don't worry about it. I'm not going to take. I'm going to give. I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to give. And I'll let God worry about the rest. That's the picture of verse 28. Don't steal. Don't take. Don't think about sin. Think about others. What can you do to help another person? And be glad and grateful for your job. That's what my dad always told me. If it was, if it was fun, you'd have to pay them. It is going to be tough, but it's a blessing from God. It's a blessing from God that God gives to us so that we can give to others. Then look at verse 29. Then he moves into, let no corrupting talk come from your mouths. A lot of translations for this word corrupting, and I think it's useful to get all the English words that, 
the translators use so they can get a feel for it. That these are unwholesome words, or putrid, or rotten, and evil, foul, impure, corrupt, depraved words. Let those kinds of words be far removed from you. And now what I would want to do is I would want to put a period there and then start inserting my definition of, okay, well, here's what are really corrupt words. And, of course, I'd make it some really small thing and go, okay, so see, none of us say corrupt words. We're all good. But I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul defines this in verse 29 because it, it's, it's rough. <laughs> Listen to what he says in verse 29. Here's what the new clothes look like. He says, no corrupting talk should come from your mouths. But first he says, only such as is good for building up. Let's just stop right there for a minute. I don't want you to say corrupt things. Unwholesome things. But here's the words that I want to have come out of your mouth. I want only words that come out of your mouth that are good for building other people up. Do you really feel like I have to say a lot less? <laughs> you know, wow. Because this means there's not going to be negative words, arguing, complaining, words that hurt, words that tear down, speaking badly about other people, gossiping, the kinds of words that come out of our mouths immediately become erased here when he gives us the first picture of the new clothes of our words is that our words would simply be words that build another person up. It's ultimately going to be for their good. And so we will not have rotten words that come out of our mouths. And if that were not enough, which to me is I think about him saying, okay, I don't want corrupting, unwholesome words. Here's the words that I want to have come out of your mouth. Only words that are edification, building up. He doesn't stop. After saying that, he says, as fits the need, as fits the occasion. So here the picture is, not only do I want you to say words that build up, but I want you to say words that are fitting the need of the person or need of the occasion. It's the right words at the right moment. And I think that's an important thing to say because sometimes we can have a tendency to go, well, I told the truth and that's all that matters. You can tell the truth at the wrong time. There are right words to say at the right time. I unfortunately did this badly to my daughter a week ago, who, who called me out on it, as uh, Grace ran the corner into my office and she hit her toe really hard on the door. I don't know why she was going so fast, but she hit her toe and she's grabbing her toe. And so I spoke the truth. You need to slow down. And she goes, that's not what I need right now. <laughs> so you're right. You're right. It was true. Didn't fit the occasion. She knew that. I didn't need to tell her that. I needed to be compassionate. I needed to be helpful. I needed to say words that fit the moment, that were helpful for the occasion. You see, it's very easy to say things that are true. Well, see, I said true. You can't get mad at me. Yeah, but it well, didn't fit the need. It didn't help the person. It didn't fit the occasion. This second picture that's given to us is so important because we can make a lot of excuses and, and really pull the ripcord. Well, I told the truth so you can't be mad at me. Yeah, but did you have to say that at that moment? Sure, it was true. You should slow down and not slam into furniture. Not helpful. Not what was needed in the moment. And we can do that to people. That rather than being compassionate and helpful and saying words that are useful for the moment, we will say the truth, we'll be honest. But in the process of being honest, we are being hurtful. We are not building up. We're not helping. We're not fitting the need of the occasion. Which is really the rest of it. If you notice, he gives a third one here. And he says uh, that words that give grace to those who hear. Don't you just to kind of emblazon these three filters into your mind about the words that are going to come out of our mouths. 
The words that will only come out of our mouths are words that are good for building up. They fit the need and give grace to those who hear. So I'm going to try to talk a lot less. Because that's really what happens when you start putting those filters on. Because you realize a lot of the things that you come have coming into your mind are not words that build up. And they're not for right for the moment. And they don't give grace to those who hear. But I want you to realize that as we build that filter into our thinking so that those are the words that are coming out of our mouths, that that will make us in the image of God. Remember that's the new clothes he talked about? These new clothes are in the likeness of God, in the image of God, of true righteousness and holiness. You remember what people said about Jesus? Here in Luke 4, verse 22, it says that everybody spoke well of Jesus and they marveled at the gracious words that are coming out of his mouth. What a blessing that would be. That people would know us for the gracious words that come out of our mouths. That people would know that when we speak, it is going to be for building up as fits the need and gives grace to the hearer. That that would be the language that they hear. It wouldn't be unwholesome. It wouldn't be corrupt. It wouldn't be awful. It wouldn't be ugly. It wouldn't be putrid and rotten. But it would really be words that carry those three pictures, build people up, fits the need, grace to those who hear. You might realize that that might be why James tells us it would be very important for us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Because you really do have to slow down to get that filter installed on there properly. <laughs> you have to really slow down and not react with your words if you're going to carefully consider those three things. If I'm going to build up and say it at the right moment as it fits the need giving grace to the ear, I've got to really think through what I'm about to say. I really need to be careful and consider, are my words going to do that? So I hope you will think about if the ending of that is words that give grace to the hearer, you know what that responsibility means on our end? Is that I'm thinking about how the other person's going to receive it. Don't you love those terrible apologies today that you see in the news that often are given? I'm sorry if you took my words the wrong way. Well, maybe you should think about how those words are going to be heard. Think about how those words are going to be received. It's not the goal to go, well, it was true, and I'm sorry that that just, you know, you didn't like it, you know, and I'm sorry that that hurt. That's not it. Does it give grace to the hearer? The way that you're going to say it, is that really the right way to say it? And is this the right moment to say it? A lot of wisdom is being asked of us here. To really carefully consider our words, what we will say, when we will say it, and how will those words be heard? Will it be a benefit to them? Will it be a good to them? Think about that word grace, that favor. It's a word that's tied to a gift. It's going to be a gift to them. You're showing them favor and grace in the words that you say. We know that James is going to say it on our tongue. Oh, what a... What, what a forest that can be set on fire by our very tongues. Here's how we don't do that. Here's how we don't scorch the highway with our tongues. The words that we say is that we are careful with these three things. Is it going to build up? Does it fit the occasion? Does it give grace to the hearer? And that really ties in strongly with verse 30. I know verse 30 can sometimes be a challenge here, but I want you to observe that in verse 30, we're talking about this old clothing that grieves God, and that verse 30 is really the larger reason for why we must put off them, those old clothes. Because he simply says there, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And if you were with us in the Wednesday studies, 
that sentence should be pretty straightforward and it clicks in really easily. But we'll go through this and you've been sealed for the day of redemption. And your old clothes are grieving God. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, think about it like this. In our study of the Holy Spirit, we observe that this great gift that we have from God is that we belong as children of God. And we are in his kingdom, and we are enjoying his blessings, enjoying salvation. We've been brought from darkness into light. Everything that God had been promising throughout history all funnel into Christ, and we are the recipients of all of those blessings and benefits that God had promised, reversing us from darkness to light, from, from devastation to hope. But you don't look like it when you talk the way you talk. You don't look like your children of God. You don't look like you've been changed from darkness to light. You don't look like you've experienced God's great reversal of redemption. You don't look like you're enjoying the covenant promises when you have corrupting, unwholesome, rotten words coming from your mouth. You see, it's very befitting that what you see the Apostle Paul trying to tell us is you know who you are. We talked about that two weeks ago. This is your identity as you belong to him. You were made in the image of God. And as God is giving you these new clothes so that you would be in true righteousness and holiness. And your tongue needs to match the clothing. Your tongue needs to match who you are. It needs to reflect. That you are no longer of that old way of thinking. No longer of the selfish point of view. No longer choosing to be like the world, but rather a tongue that matches being children of God, enjoying the blessings of God, redeemed by God, and enjoying all of those promises and hopes for the future to come. All right, let me put some teeth on it. We haven't already... Does what we say online grieve God? The words that we say online, email, social media, those words grieve God. Does what we say online show that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit awaiting the day of redemption? Do our posts, our shares, our comments, our likes, our memes, or anything else, are they good for building up, fit the occasion, and give grace to those who hear? We reflect that we're Christians in what we say, in what we share, in what we post, in what we like. All of those things. This is an important communication factor in our, in our world right now. And we cannot just let it, okay, when I talk to somebody face to face, I've got to have that filter. We need that filter on in the world, and we need that filter on in our social media, and the way that we share things, talk about things. We need to have that. Social media has turned into essentially a toxic cesspool where everybody complains, tears everybody else down, rails at everything going on. And it's not what God wants. We can get sucked into that. Complain, negative, awful, good. Words for building up. It's the occasion. Give grace to those who read it. That should be our filter. And I would submit to us that if what we have as influences in our lives make that difficult, that we should disconnect from those influences. If our listening to the news or talk radio or social media or family or friends spurs this anger or fire within you that causes you to spew out the hatred, negativity, or whatever else that comes out of you that is not good for upbuilding, fits the occasion and gives grace to those who hear, 
and we need to stop being influenced by those things. You know, Lord, um, we have to be followers of God. We cannot allow ourselves to fall into the ruts and rituals of our culture. Just because our culture rails doesn't mean we rail. Just because everybody else is negative doesn't mean that we are going to be that way. Just because people say awful things doesn't mean we're going to be the ones saying awful things. We need to be so careful that we are reflecting the glory of God and showing the image of God in the things that we say. And so do not grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed you for the day of redemption. Let that be that final lens over our, this filter that we've established. Is what I'm about to say going to grieve God? Does this represent him? Shows Christianity what it means to be a follower of Christ. Shows the love of God for humanity and how he desires all to be saved. We need to be so careful about how we talk to each other, how we talk to people in our families, how we talk to people at work, how we talk to our neighbors, how we talk online. We have so many avenues where we can allow our tongue to be the raging fire rather than being the thing that gives grace to the hero. Let me end by putting it forward to us like this. Our, our old clothes, old clothes are the things that take from other people. Selfish. What can I get? Rather than what can I give. Old clothes speak foul words. Unwholesome, corrupting words unhelpful words. New clothes speak words that build up, are right for the moment, give grace to the hearer. The old clothes grieve the Holy Spirit. And the new clothes are saying words that God would be pleased by because we're representing Him well. We are shining His lights. We are being salt of the earth. We are walking in His footsteps. We're representing that by the very words that we say. And so consider then this very short paragraph about your walk with God. What are you saying to people? And when people be able to say about us, they speak gracious words and they're marveled by it. There might not be a better time in our culture right now to be a person who does that. Not a lot of people speak uplifting, helpful, good for the moment, gracious words. But you can. At work tomorrow, you can. In your home today, you can. To your family members, you can. To your neighbors when you're dealing with them, you can be the one to speak the gracious words. So many scenarios. When you're in that long line, You don't understand why there's only one checker open for the whole store. You can be the gracious words. You can be the one who's not lifting. You can be the one that says something that's good for the moment. Rather than being like the world with its old clothes. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father. Lord, we just start by asking for forgiveness. Lord, it's just so easy for our words to not fall in line with the three things that we've looked at. Lord, we, we ask for forgiveness for our idle words, foolish words, hurtful words, words that tore others down, angry words, words that didn't fit the occasion, Words that didn't give grace to the future. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for thinking about ourselves in the way that we talk and the way that we act. Lord, we pray that you would transform our hearts and really help us to install this filter so that our words would always be words that build up 
that are for the good of the hearer and gives grace. Help us to do this, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not fall into the mold of the world. Lord, help us to not get caught up in the, the rage and the anger and the, the spewing of vile things that happens all around us. So insulate us from it, Lord, and help us to have transformed words that will be gracious to those who speak like that. Help us to shine as lights in a culture that continues to be ever darkened. Help us to say things that are right for the moment that truly reflect you. And Lord, give us the strength to disconnect from things that are causing our hearts to not be pure towards you. Help us to remove those influences and add more influences of you, your word, so that we can speak as you want us to speak and live as you want us to live. So God, forgive us for our past. And Lord, help us to move, move, move forward with new hope, with gracious words. In Jesus' name. How does that hurt me? Awesome. Feel me. And I hope that you will allow me to talk us to really sink in, cut to the core, and change so that we can be what God ultimately wants us to be. To reflect Jesus in the world. And to be the ones that can extend the great invitation of salvation. To come to Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Confess him to be the Son of God who died for your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can start that journey with him. If you can help you in any way to do this, we ask you to come. We'll be safe and we'll be safe.